The second scripture reading today is from the second letter of Paul to Timothy. Chapter 1, verses, let's see, 1 to 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience, as did my fathers, when I remember you constantly in my prayers. As I remember your tears, I long night and day to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and now, I am sure, dwells in you. Hence, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. Do not be ashamed, then, of testifying to our Lord, nor of me, this prisoner, but take your share of suffering for the gospel in the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not in virtue of our works, but in virtue of his own purpose and the grace which he gave us in Christ Jesus ages ago, and now has manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For this gospel, I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, and therefore I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am sure that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sounds of words which you have heard from me, in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard the truth that has been entrusted to you by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. May God has his blessing to his words today. So this letter is all about the good treasure, the good truth that we have been given as a church to guard, um, to pass on, to share, to love, to treasure, um, and to teach um, what it has done for us, the hope that it has given us, and the life that we have found in it. So since it's World Communion Sunday, I would love to do this sermon along with the communion liturgy. So kids, do you remember what page everybody needs to turn to in their hymnals? Number 12. If you get out those big blue books and turn to page 12, we're going to follow along with the communion liturgy. Okay, who from Sunday school remembers where we start? Who's invited to the table? Everybody, come on, Joel. You got it. You got it. You were there. You know. Megan and Sarah have this already. Brian and Kevin are back there. Okay, Emma, I see you too. Okay, are you guys ready? We're gonna help the adults today. Okay, so who's invited to the table? Okay, this is the best part about being United Methodists. Everybody, we have an open table. So this means that this is not our table. This is not the United Methodist Church's table. This is Christ's table. And Christ came for all, and so all are invited, and all are welcome. Um, And this means that all are welcome even if we've done awful things, even if we've done amazing things, because the invitation does not depend on what we do or don't do. It depends on God's grace, and God's grace is present, and it is available for all. And so that's where we start. We start knowing that this is beyond us, and that there is a God filled with love that we cannot even begin to imagine that has set this table, and that invites and wants everyone to experience it. But there are some things that we've not done real well. So, Megan and Sarah, what do we do? Do you remember the big C word? Confession. Do you remember what it means? What do we say when we've hurt somebody? Sorry. You've got it. 
absolutely. And so that's what, we're go- what we do before we come to the table, whether we do that collectively in our liturgy or whether that is a part of our personal prayer. And as we were talking at Sunday school this morning, it's about being able to acknowledge and to name the places where we have hurt others so that this can be a safe and welcoming space for all. So that when we come, we come fully open and vulnerable ourselves um, for those of us who have done the hurting so that we can name that and know where we need God's love to put us on the right path and call us back enough back again. And for those who have been hurt, to know what we can bring to be healed and the hardest thing of all, what we can give over and trust in that step by step that God will take care of. Because it's hard to give over injustices and wrongs that have been done us or how we've been hurt. But if we are to be able to come with full hearts then there's a confession that comes and a healing that comes when we're able to be that vulnerable. Um, my hardest point in looking at this in the global perspective is when um, I was studying abroad in Ecuador. And that was the first time I was outside of the very beautiful um, bubble I had um, had the privilege of experiencing um, growing up where everything was good. And the people I knew um, were wonderful and the church I was at was about joy and building and I had that family and I had that church and, and I had that safety net. But it wasn't until I left that in Ecuador and found out how religion and church itself has been a source of harm and, and how what had given me such joy and such grounding and such direction in my part had damaged so many others. And so between the personal stories that I heard of, you know, the people that I was out there with coming up and being like, so you're going to seminary, you're going to be a pastor? What's up with that? Like, why would you do that? And then I have all of the horrible stories of the church of what they've done and what we've said. And then I have a research project for my philosophy class where I find a contract made between North American missionaries and the Ecuadorian government removing a tribe from their land in the Amazon to a reservation so that the missionaries can have them in one place to evangelize to and the government can drill the land for oil. At which point, my faith very much broke um, and seeing all of this harm done in Christ's name. And it was really hard for me to get a feel and find a new foundation in this universe because I wasn't equipped with laments and how to pray my anger and how to cry my frustration and and my fear. Um, And so that was something that I began to discover in seminary and very much through the work of Howard Thurman um, and, and other liberation theologians and reclaiming that story Um, and reclaiming the gospel. And so we move from that confession and that naming that has to happen and has to be a part of who we are because then otherwise, all of the joy and all of the wonder isn't honestly or deeply rooted. But if we have that naming of the hard conversations and of the hard things that have happened, then there's space for everything to be real, for us to live an authentic and honest and transparent faith, for us to be able to name as the choir is saying that we're going to do our best to take the next faithful step. And that'll be hard sometimes when we cross that God, that will, God will be with us and help us to do that. Um, And so after confession, we come to the great Thanksgiving, right? That in-gathering of all of the community where we say the Lord be with you and also with you. And we lift up our hearts and we give thanks for all of who God is as creator and all of what God has done and bringing us to this space. I wasn't able to turn around my... um, horror and learning at what had happened in colonial periods and, and, and others until I um, was able to study um, indigenous Hispanic worship music um, with Pablo Sosa in Argentina. 
And I was talking with him about this. And if we can go back to the um, seed slide, um, he talked about it with me like this. Um, and he said, Kate, we had missionaries come over and bring us the seed of the gospel. They brought us the gospel. And for that, we will be forever grateful for that gift. Now, they got a little overzealous and brought it in the pot of North American culture. Um, and they presented all of it to us as the gospel itself. So what our job is now is to figure out what is gospel seed and what is pot. Break apart the pot, take the gospel seed, and plant it in our own soil. Because we still want that seed, and we're still grateful that we have it. And this is what Pablo Sosa has dedicated his life to, to reclaiming the indigenous forms of music in Argentina and reintroducing them into worship and into the church. Um, because of our North American missionary pot um, that had that beautiful four-part hymnody as the only acceptable church music that there was. And it's awesome, and it's beautiful, um, but it's not the only way um, to know God, and especially um, for those who it's not their indigenous form of music, and music's such a powerful connector, right? You have to have what is you and yours to be able to celebrate that and use it um, as a way to connect with God and understand what God is about. And so as we gather in and celebrate God the creator, we celebrate God who is planted and who will work with us to create um, those rich and soil, uh, rich and fertile lands that we can plant the gospel in. And then we have Christ. And so that's the next part of communion, right? Where we have that sanctus, where we have that hymn of holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Um, and then we have the part about Jesus, right? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna literally means God save us. And so we have the creating work, we have the planting work, but we need the saving, right? Soil anywhere is messy, and we need to figure out what's too rocky and what needs some weeding and where the help is needed. And so we pray to Christ, who has come, who is coming, and who will come to lead us in that saving process. And there is no other place that I have ever been in my entire life um, than in worship in South Korea last year, where I have felt prayer like I have never felt it before. There is a tradition in South Korea of dawn prayer, of gathering, wait for it, at 5 o'clock every single morning, including Sunday, um, to pray God into the new day. And there's a service much like this, a small devotional service, but the vast majority of the prayer um, is everyone saying their own individual prayers out loud at the same time. So it's this huge sound that just fills the entire church. And we talk about every corner of the earth coming together to sing and to pray this sanctus of Christ saving us. And that is what I think about of every voice lifted to its fullest, no embarrassment, no holding back, women standing up and shouting and crying, men huddled and, and praying, children um, shouting and or um, even babies just sleeping, I don't know how, but in the midst of all of this. It's the whole family that's gathered and it's the whole sound that's gathered. And so we celebrate this saving power that we can call on and that we know. And then this next part of the communion um, liturgy is what Christ has done and how Christ has given us life. And you cannot, and these, this is the part that can change, and you're going to hear that this Sunday because I wrote a special liturgy for us. So that's the part that can change in communion liturgies of talking and witnessing to what God has done. The part that can't change are the words of institution and the epiclesis, where we remember the center night of our faith, where we remember Christ gathering us into a room and asking us to remember him in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. 
And on this World Communion Sunday, we're going to celebrate all of the different grains that were grown and all of the different soils that have been brought together into one loaf. And we're going to celebrate all of the different grapes that have been grown and all of the different vines all around the world brought together into one cup. And we're going to remember that it is only through the power of the Holy Spirit that this becomes a mystery. This is my favorite part. Because with the presence of the Holy Spirit, this becomes a family meal that isn't just limited to our one time and our one place here on Sunday, October 2nd in Cockeysville, Maryland. This becomes a meal that transcends time and space so that it is a meal celebrated all around the world and across time. So the community of saints, past and present and to come, are gathered at this table. This is our foretaste of the heavenly banquet, of what will happen when Christ returns and we all feast at his heavenly banquet. You remember that part of the communion liturgy. This is our appetizer um, to bring us in and want more and want more and want that fullness and want to be a part of building it. Because we are fed and we are blessed and we are sent. So that the bread that we receive, the body and the blood of Christ, then becomes, we become, the body and the blood of Christ redeemed by his blood. And we are made one with God, with all of our brothers and sisters all around the world and in ministry to all the world. This is our call. This is our purpose. This is the good treasure that we are guarding. And so we come to this space, and Dottie and Gary are thinking of the people and of the connections that have been made across these countries. We are thinking of the family that has come from Ghana on the hand-woven cloth of the families that are present, of a mentor that brought me this back um, from Israel and from Jerusalem, of the Guatemalan family who put that stole and the um, Russian icon of a friend and colleague who found her call there. All around the world is family. And when I was in Argentina with Pablo Sosa, we stood around uh, the communion table like we are about to. And on the last Sunday that I had with them there, um, they said a special prayer and said that you are forever connected to us and a part of your family. And because you are here connected to us, that means your family and your home church are now a part of our family and our church as well. And they sang a song that Pablo wrote um, for their family church anniversary and celebrating all of the time of the Barrio Flores United Methodist Church in Buenos Aires. And it's from Psalm. And it says, Miren que bueno, que bueno es. Look and wonder, look and see how good it is for us to be here gathered together. Um, and the psalm goes on, and we have a little bit of that in the communion liturgy. But for this day, I give thanks. I give thanks because I know that I am not alone. And I give thanks because of the faith that has been passed on from generation to generation, as our letter said. And I give thanks that no matter what the church has faced or what the church has done, that there is a God who brings forth hope. In an entire book of Lamentations, lamenting all of the horrors and all of the evils that have befallen us and that we have perpetrated, is this one song in the middle. Therefore, I remember and I call to mind that the steadfast love of the Lord is new every morning. God's mercies will last forever. And so, friends, may we together with our brothers and sisters all around the world take another faithful step in building God's kingdom. Do you join me for communion? We can't wait for this bread anymore.